Hey there, and welcome to the Eastern Bloc, the channel that offers an in-depth view at car culture in the Eastern Europe. You see, we car guys, well, we like all sorts of cars. Sure, we prefer high performance and enthusiast cars, but we also like strange cars, quirky cars, luxury cars, why not even SUVs? The fact of the matter is though that most of us can't really afford to buy or enjoy them. This seems to be more evident in my home country as the contrast between automobiles is the highest one around. Not only in terms of value but in terms of maintenance standards. On the other hand society is pushing right now towards the electrification of the vehicle. Looking at this as some sort of get out of jail free pass, a solution to all the problems that the combustion engine has created over its past century of existence and heavy usage, such as high congestion and pollution rates in urbanized areas, complex engineering, poor reliability, rising fuel prices, and the list could go on really. So. I have to ask myself, where does this leave us, the self-declared petrol heads of the world, more specifically those of the Eastern European variety? Well, I'm here to try and find out, and I invite you to join me on this rather long and tedious journey, at the end of which I hope to have answered all these important questions. And as we all know, every important quest starts with that small but crucial first step. Indeed, I intend to do the same and work my way up from humble beginnings with cars such as this, the second generation Ford Focus European model. So let's get to it. Okay, so by now I think everybody has seen one of these cars, we all know the Focus, but what's it really all about? Sure, it's a C-segment car in Europe, a compact, non-premium offering from Ford. It was launched in 2004 with the facelift coming in 2008, but let me give you a bit of a context, at the time Ford owned a couple of prestigious brands, including Volvo, Jaguar and Aston Martin. And with this car, they really wanted to show off. In terms of design, I really see inspiration from Aston Martin everywhere. From the pull-back headlights, as sculpted around the front of the bodywork, to these aggressive wheel arches, to the median lines, I have another way of explaining the design of this car. It's better looking than the non-facelift version, which was itself modern and really uh, contemporary, but a bit lacking and dull, really. It's got that uh, highly functional, but um, not really exciting design. It's almost robotic and purposeful in every single way. This, however, is so packed with features that it almost looks like uh, you put on a tracksuit just to look uh, really urban and aggressive without going any, to any outdoor sports activities. You know, it's like having a, a FUBU uh, lineup in your closet. Those clothes don't really do anything in terms of practicality, but they sort of look good when you want to look the part. It's exactly the same here. I mean, every line seems to be pulled out and exaggerated compared to the non-facelift version of this car. It is a good thing, it's a bit cheesy, at the back there's a faux diffuser, if you look too close, you realize, you start to realize and question whether these design cues are actually functional or not. I'm sure some of them are, I think personally most aren't. General shape and feel of the car, well this is a C-segment car as I've said, it's a compact version, it's a compact offering from Ford. What you get for that? Well, basically, it's a great car for city driving. 
It's, it's easy to park, it's great to see out of, visibility is great all around and really uh, maybe a bit too tall for my taste it sort of mimics that pre-SUV era but don't mistake it to a crossover tentative no this car came out when MPVs were all the rage you see in the 1990s every automaker uh, thought that MPVs were going to take over the car market Consequently, design cues are seen all around this, uh, this uh, market segment. Uh, this A-pillar, typical of front-wheel drive cars, uh, almost touches the middle of the front wheels. The engine is pushed forward. The, the bonnet line is short and uh, it hangs over the front wheels. Everything is kind of stubby and uh, Put, pushed together mind you it's not as uh, uh, obvious as in the Peugeot 307 if you look at that car well PSA really went all in with that uh, with that particular model they they thought that uh, that was the best uh, the best look and the best uh, engineering they could give so they went a bit further with that MPV look one thing I particularly like about this uh, generation of cars is the fact that still even if the bonnet is stubby and short at least it's fairly low to the ground and you can see the ratio from the wheel arch to the top of the bonnet is rather short it's a nice touch okay so let's move on to the interior and see what's it all about from the inside So interior space in the Ford Focus from the driver's perspective. While you are surrounded by a sea of grayness, hard plastics are everywhere and it's easily uh, it's easy to to bash this interior and to criticize uh, but actually it's a nice place to be in. I mean quality is mediocre Everything is uh, hard to touch and really unpleasant except for this upper side of the dashboard but in fact in all actuality it's rather consistent easy to clean and maintain uh, there's no exaggerated rattles or uh, uh, obvious defects or everything seems to fit well enough um, well sure there are some wear and tear uh, marks like this gear lever and also the six o'clock area for the steering wheel has been damaged by uh, extensive uh, um, exposure to UV rays well to sunlight basically but uh, other than that mm, the major letdown for me at least uh, are the seats well while they do uh, while they are thought of uh, correctly in terms of ergonomics and the driver's seat is adjustable uh, on uh, every level even in the trend models uh, they they don't really offer any support well they're flat and uh, you kind of feel this after two to three hours uh, of driving even as a passenger actually these uh, units uh, in the Ford however at least in this focus are really lacking and basically you can understand this because Ford is considered um, a much uh, a much a very uh, cheap brand uh, in uh, in Europe uh, it's not bottom basement well in my opinion it goes like this Dacia Skoda Ford Renault Alfa Peugeot Citroen Opel is somewhere in the middle maybe above Ford in terms of interior offerings and then there's Volkswagen so if you want a better appointed car in terms of interior quality and uh, everything else well you turn to Volkswagen what do you turn to Ford for well actually 
it's for the driving experience but i'll get to that in a minute another thing that i don't like is this roof liner as i've said so it's a cheap cardboard have a listen yeah it sort of sounds nasty and it feels the part as well it's not that meshed soft and um, you know uh, premium feel of this however this just feels like uh, two steps above uh, plain cloth or <laughs> i don't know it even reminds me of um, cheap stuffed uh, toy animals or something like that so not really pleasant it's so let's move over to the back and see what's what with the rear seating arrangement in the back and with the trunk the gray theme continues in the back as well well you have one thing to notice these door cards although they look uh, similar almost identical to the ones in front well they're actually of a lower quality which uh, again is a bit of a letdown uh, all these pieces of trim while they try to uh, emulate and to uh, imitate leather they're actually hard plastics molded into the shapes of leather there's uh, nice uh, textures to everything but uh, as soon as you touch them you realize have a listen <laughs> scratchy every everything is scratchy hard uh, rough and so on the bench seat uh, well actually it's kind of co comfortable there's enough room for for your head uh, also there's enough uh, leg room here uh, when there's two people uh, there's enough uh, there's enough space here three is very crowded I wouldn't recommend it not not even on short journeys but other than that uh, well typical mid 2000s uh, rear uh, rear interior design there's some uh, nice uh, nicely padded pockets in the in the in the seats um, and there's a lot of things lacking uh, what you would consider a necessity in 2021 for example no uh, no uh, heating vents or cooling vents on the back there's no rear armrest in the middle sure sure the titanium models had those features but this being a trend car consequently consequently it does not the upholstery of this car well it's it's rather pleasant uh, feeling and um, it is rough it's got some color in it but just enough to make it interesting not too much uh, to uh, point out any particular stains which this car uh, also has you know in 10 to 12 years of using a car you sometimes uh, splash it you sometimes get it dirty and this upholstery really um, really um, wears its age rather nicely that's it in terms of interior uh, design and layout let's move over to the back well this being a compact car and all trunk space i guess is adequate it's got that uh, magic uh, 300 to 350 liter uh, boot capacity uh, it's enough for a couple of groceries just don't think you're gonna haul anything with this bikes and uh, working uh, materials construction materials and so on then again had you needed that type of uh, trunk you would have got at least an estate version or maybe a different car altogether the lining and the plastics here are uh, nice and tough they're also they're actually not that nice and they're rather scratchy and uh, rough but that's what they did uh, it's no surprise if uh, there's some things lacking in the front uh, in the interior compartment surely the boot space will be cheaper as well cheaper feeling at least but it's nice and uh, concise and uh, well put together 
it sort of works. One thing that doesn't really work uh, is this, uh, this parcel shelf, which is rather uh, flimsy and uh, I know every car has this uh, made out of um, pressed cardboard, but this just feels a bit uh, cheaper and um, consequently it's easier to bend or break. Another thing I don't like about this, uh, uh, this uh, rear uh, focus uh, arrangement is the way the trunk uh, assembly closes. Oh. Have a listen. Uh, it's rather cheap feeling. It works every time. There's no problems with the contacts, with the release or anything. There's no water inside the car, but it's just cheap feeling. That's just another one of those things that Ford chose to do. You see the rear uh, grab handle assembly has been reworked. Of course, the badge has not stood the test of time that well and uh, really the wiper wasn't replaced when uh, necessary and there's a lot of scratches and uh, creases in the window well everything is worn out these were chromed at some point these letters the badging hasn't really stood the test of time there's a lot of necks, dings, uh, bends, and so on. But that's the case with um, city cars, actually, with daily drivers. While there were uh, many engine offerings with this uh, Focus platform, this one, <clears throat> this particular model, uh, sports, and I do use that term lightly and loosely, <laughs> sports the 1.6 TDCI variant, I guess the most common one of them all. Uh, it's in the 90 horsepower flavor because it lacks the particle filter. That is both a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because it's an, a more reliable engine. It's a bad thing because it's, I guess, harsher to the environment and it, off, uh, it only offers 90 horsepower. The particle filter one had 109 horsepower. I don't think there's any uh, real reason to get into this engine too much because uh, really it doesn't offer anything special. It's your typical run-of-the-mill, small displacement, economic variant of a popular trend in Europe, uh, by which I mean using diesel cars. PSA just, well, this was in the middle of diesel wars. Everybody bought diesel cars in the 2000s and the 1990s. So PSA just came out and said, okay, let's do a more economic version. We have powerful engines. Our rivals have powerful engines. Let's just do one which gets great MPG. So they did. And subsequently, uh, you can get uh, around uh, 60 mpg if you drive like a miser that's about 3 to 3.5 liter liters of fuel per 100 kilometers but that's really if you just stretch it out on a straight road at 80 mile 80 kilometers an hour in fifth gear which doesn't really seem to have any point but some people choose to do that um, anyway, it's not a fast engine, as I've mentioned before, it takes 12, more than 12 seconds to accelerate to 60, kilo, 60 miles per hour or 100 kilometers per hour, which is rather uh, boring and excruciating, excruciatingly slow if you're used to high performance cars. As an upside though, I think it can be driven swiftly and energetically once you get over 60 kilometers per hour. If you play with the gearbox, you can get nice ratios and decent acceleration feels from this car. It's an, ups it's an upbeat tempo sort of driving. No. It's it's not sporty in any sense of the word. I cannot stress that enough but it might be considered fun. And just for the fun of it, let's have a lesson at this engine. <laughs> Ford really wanted to overcomplicate things with the hood release.
instead of using a latch be below uh, the steering wheel they chose to do this uh, thing with the key which is rather annoying but more importantly it uh, it creates uh, the risk of damage to the key because you just turn it too violently. Right, driving the Ford Focus. Well, you can really see what uh, what the Europeans are all about when you look at these types of cars. Just have a look at this uh, sloping uh, sloping roof line and the way that the cab seems to be pushed forward. And you can see this is a typical front uh, front wheel drive design. It's not bad by any means. We've come to ostracize and to criticize, to demonize even front wheel drive cars because us as car enthusiasts, we secretly believe that rear wheel drive is, uh, well, really uh, car nirvana and that's what we that's what we should all aspire for but actually around town as, and as a daily driver front wheel drive is miles better and I think we also know this to be a fact even if we don't accept it for some reason now the Ford Focus the most important thing I haven't mentioned about this car well it's a great driver's car it's not a sporty car in any sense and it's not really a it's not really an enthusiast's car but it is a driver's car and I'll try to explain this uh, the best way I can in the following minutes because it's a rather a point that I mean it's strange to me you, you couldn't know this but actually in my country few people realize that Fords are great to drive you've got independent all-round all suspension for the wheels control blades at the back multi-link in the front I'm not going to pretend I can explain this to you because I'm not that uh, proficient in uh, youtuber talk and reviewing stuff but uh, actually I, I kind of understand how it works and I've looked into it and you can really feel the, the effect the chassis is supposedly 10% stiffer than the, the first generation Ford Focus which in itself was a great car and was very much lauded by the press at the time this is also a bit porkier at around 100 kilograms more to 200 maybe in every uh, variant and it's not necessarily a catastrophic thing but it's not something we car guys prefer and there's more space in in the um, in the cabin and it's also a bit more numb in the in the uh, steering department because it has an electric steering wheel and seeing as this is one of the first generation of steering wheels um, of electric uh, units uh, mounted on such a high volume car while it's a bit artificial and lacking is not that it's a bad unit but I think they just didn't get the setup quite right Mind you, they improved that, uh, Ford really improved that on the second generation and by the time um, uh, 2015 or so came about, uh, everybody was offering them. While it is a bit numb dead center, nevertheless, it is quite fun and engaging once you start driving it a bit more uh, aggressively. I'm not saying that you should, I'm just mentioning that here's the sun visor deal I've, I've uh, 
uh, said before. Um, uh, what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that you can really drive it uh, more than the basic economy car and have a bit of a fun with it, like so, and instantly feel <laughs> that the car really puts a smile on your face. And it responds quite nicely to your commands and it gives great input. And while in terms of uh, engine uh, response, uh, uh, between 2000 and 2600 rpm that's the sweet spot that's where you can play with it any other uh, any other power band that you use will be basically just for your um, for your subjective opinion or to satisfy your ego there's no real point look i'm going to push it over 3000 there's no real there's no real use for that power band. It is 80 to 90 kilometers per hour is where this car is at its best because it can accelerate if you downshift and it can keep up with traffic easily enough. Speaking of which, let's talk about the gear shifts and the and the gearbox itself. Well, it is only a five-speed, then this is a bit of a downer. It's interesting because it's sort of grabby without being vague. It's precise enough, but it's not oily slick. And it doesn't. Boo, you really did make a wrong turn here. Let's try to revise this. Okay, I'm going to do a quasi acceptable maneuver and this is why you really have to appreciate front wheel drive cars. I just made a three point turn in a 10 meter space. So speaking about the gearbox, well it is grabby but it's precise in the same uh, in the same um, it's precise at the same time. I know it's rather uh, paradoxical, even nonsensical, but that's how I feel about it. It's, but uh, there's also the feeling that it just doesn't want to uh, engage as easily as other units. So, uh, power uh, delivery, well, it's geared towards economy because it's a five speed. Six speeds, six speed gearboxes were not, uh, were not, um, were, in, were not the norm at the time yet. Well, at least from Ford they weren't. Uh, I know that uh, Renault had some small engines with a six speed gearbox, the 1.6 DCI, but Ford at least didn't offer them until 2011 in the small diesel units. Sorry about this, very unprofessional of me. I forgot to mention, of course, this is a manual car and it's a manual. It has that third pedal, which we car guys really covet. In a sense of the matter, having this car, you could fool yourself into thinking that you have an enthusiast car. It's got a great suspension setup. It's got well, more than acceptable steering, really. And it's got a manual gearbox. Never mind that it's only a 1.6 TDCI, a diesel unit, which really doesn't offer any kind of performance at all. But, well, at least, it, look, at least in terms of the suspension and steering setup, you can have fun with it. And I, this is not a myth. It's a better handling car all round. There are some competitors of which I'll talk about and my personal take on them, but really Ford has nailed it with the focus. Enough, every generation seemed to get fatter and more subdued, but they still retained that, that uh, I don't know, that handling spirit, that sort of vague uh, sporty DNA that 
a car that's fun to drive should have, which this actually is. Popped into my mind that with every generation, people seem to complain that Focus uh, has gone more uh, subdued, more uh, uh, compromised in terms of handling and, uh, and uh, road feel sensations, road sensations to the driver. And I didn't really agree with this fact uh, until I saw that the fourth generation Focus, the one that came in 2019, well, they didn't really offer the, uh, well, they didn't really offer the um, um, independent suspension all, all round anymore. Well, I do apologize for the inconsistency in filming. As you can see, it's a different time of day and I have, uh, I have decided to shed, <laughs> to shed a layer of clothes. It's too warm right now. It's uh, middle of the spring. Uh, and uh, well, mornings are cold, but afternoons are a bit, um, are a bit uh, on the hot side so I decided to lose the jacket I'm finding it uh, a bit difficult to pinpoint the exact uh, conclusion that I want to take from this review for now I have just uh, mentioned a few things that probably uh, are not well known but anybody who's uh, at least partly uh, involved in uh, the auto culture knows about Fords. I was mentioning that they're uh, well they're fun to drive. Right. So there you have it. Buy the Focus second generation as a first car if you're a young person and you are a car guy or car girl as well. But I'm running out of time because my SD card has been full. You can see that I'm rambling and I do want to uh, take this chance and extend um, my deepest uh, appreciation to anyone who might be watching this. And what I would like to ask for is your patience and, uh, well, maybe your critical and, and honest uh, takes and comments. I will be doing this some more and I will be trying to be more concise and uh, eloquent in the episodes that will come later. I know I'm rambling quite a lot, so instead of a closing line, I leave you with me uh, driving around my hometown. So, so, until the next time then, see you later. <laughs>